Okay, <clears throat> so let me start. Uh, you know, economic growth, everybody talks about it. That when, you know, now, nowadays the Philippines is growing very well, of almost 6%, one of the fastest growing economy the Philippines is at the moment. But the economists tend to uh, talk about, you know, the growth as a development. You know, they, they think that, that if any country has achieved high economic growth, uh, it is developing very well. But my view is quite opposite of that, that what I will be talking about is that growth is necessary, but it's not sufficient to make the people better off. Now, it's true that economic growth generates goods and services in the economy. It generates goods and services in the economy, which we, which I call it as an economic pie, okay, which needs to be enlarged to achieve a prosperity, you know, because there are goods and services have to be produced. So the prosper, prosperity comes from, from these goods and services which people have available to them. Now, but did I view that growth generates goods and services, which, which are just the means, you know, that people have means to better their life, to enhance their life. But everybody does not share uh, the prosperity or pie, uh, which is generated by economic growth. Recently, I came across a write-up from Nobel laureate Angus Deaton. Uh, uh, you must have heard of his name. And he's saying that, that growth is necessary, yeah, but many people don't get the benefits of growth. Uh, if they get the benefits of the growth, the be growth benefits are very meager for many people. So, so the growth is measured in terms of GDP, growth rate in GDP per capita, total GDP, but it does not give people, all people don't share the same amount of affluence or means they, the growth is generating. So, so what I say, the pie distribution, the pie, the economic pie, which is the total output which is generated in the economy, pie distribution determines how population shares the pie. If the pie share is equitable, we may call it shared prosperity. And our ultimate social objective is to achieve shared prosperity. And that is my view that growth is not sufficient to have a shared prosperity. We can have a prosperity, but not shared prosperity. Now, economists are deeply divided about how we achieve shared prosperity. Some believe that society must focus on policies to enlarge the pie first, and then we should have a policies to divide the pie equitably. You know, that's the, it's, you know, one view of the economist. The belief is that expanding pie, pie size, and dividing the pie are mutually exclusive. You know, as if they are two different things, they are mutually exclusive. But we don't share with this view. We think that both distribution and pie, pie distribution and total prosperity, they are the same phenomenon, part of the part of the two phenomena, and growth and distribution are interrelated. You know, they have to be simultaneously addressed. You know, we cannot just say, okay, we have a growth first, and then we 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 distribute the output which is generated in the economy, our economic pie, and distribute to the people. No, no, both are 
interrelated and they have to be determined simultaneously. So, so what is done in the paper? Yeah, my focus is on both enlarging the pi and also how pi is distributed or how pi is shared. So, so this paper talks how to integrate the two, you know, that growth as well as as well as the distribution of the pi. So this gives rise to linking the two phenomena gives rise to recently evolved four development goals. You know, I have four development goals, pro-poor growth, inclusive growth, pro-poor development, and inclusive development. Now, unfortunately, literature does not make the distinction between that. You know, they, they think they are, they are the same thing. But here I will inform you that they are not the same thing. These four goals, in my view, they are the alternative characterization of shared prosperity. You know, they are, that how prosperity is shared, you know? So these different goals, there are four goals to know how prosperity is shared. So this paper defined these four goals and providing a methodology to operationalize them using the real world data. And I must also tell you that the Philippines, I have got a lot of experience with the Philippines data. I used to work before. And I think that a lot of data are available in Philippines. They have done very good surveys you know, they, they, in, in Philippines. So the information is available, data are available. So all the, you know, this methodology, which I'm going to talk about, can be easily applied to Philippines. And I hope that PIDS will take up that, you know, uh, research and apply this methodology to, to the Philippines. So, so in this paper, because it was, you know, I was invited to write papers from India. So I have given the illustration from India using Indian data. Although a lot of you know interesting data which I required was not available, but whatever was available, I presented in this paper. Uh, so it's not the perfect illustration, but just to illustrate the methodology. But I think the Philippines may have uh, more richer data, so we can apply this uh, techniques uh, methodology. Uh, more fully. Now, the distribution of pi is fundamental. Actually, in 50s and 60s, trickle down was the dominant development study. I mean, you, you must have known, you know, the 50s and 60s. And it implied that economic growth was a dominant factor that would automatically enhance people's standard of living. It will automatically reduce poverty. So idea was that we should focus on economic growth. And when, uh, I mean, growth means that, you know, when you focus on the growth means that the people, the entrepreneurs and all that, when they <clears throat> invest in the country, then output is generated out of that in those investments. So then they say that trickle down was that when first trickle down means that first benefits of the growth goes to the people who, who are investing and rich. And then when they start spending the money, then it trickles down to the poor and poverty is reduced. So idea of trickle down was that you don't have to do anything, just promote growth and you, you will you know, uh, achieve poverty reduction. But this trickle down continued, but in 1970s, there was a book, very, very prominent book, very famous book called Redistribution with Growth. It was written by World Bank economists, Aluvaria Chenri, 
and, and others, Carter and Henry, they said that, you know, that trickle down was not sufficient. You know, that poverty reduction will be very slow. There has been a lot of growth in the developing countries, but poverty continued to be higher. So, but interestingly, despite of these concerns in the 70s, there were two World Bank economists, Dollar and Cray. Hmm? Actually, at that time, I was at, at the Asian Development Bank in 2000. Uh, I joined uh, A Asian ADB in 1999. I was a, a staff consultant for, for more than a year. Huh? Then this uh, uh, working paper of this paper came out at that time when I was at the ADB. So despite of these concerns, this paper, Dollar and Clay, published, this one became a highly influential paper. It's called Growth is Good for the Poor. Hmm? That concluded that growth generates, generally does benefit the poor and that anyone who cares about the poor should favor growth enhancing policy of the good rule of law, fiscal discipline, openness to international trade and, and so on. So that was the, you know, that is similar to the trickle down that well back, although trickle down was uh, lost its shine in the 70s, people started criticizing, but even the new millennium, the World Bank you know, economists they published that paper that growth is good for the poor. Is it? And that's what I will be questioning that. But then, uh, then there's the issue that is distribution important, you know? So there's a book called Martin Bronfenor. He published a seminal book in 1971 entitled Income Distribution Theory. So he raised an important question. Is distribution a sufficiently important problem for serious study? I mean, interesting that many economists didn't think that distribution was an important, huh? was fundamental. They, they thought growth was more fundamental. But this uh, Martin Bronfener, he brought out in his chapter one, he, he presents a sample of diverse views from very economists, uh, very well-known economists. Some economists viewed distribution as fundamental, while others thought that distribution was unimportant. So there was no clear consensus on this issue. So if you want to, but my view now here is that if we want to achieve shared prosperity, then we consider distribution alone. We consider distribution alone with economic growth to be fundamental. So let me draw your attention to a number of the quotations. You know, there was Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, India's Prime Minister. Uh, in as early as 1939, he, he wrote in, from, in his book, uh, this Discovery of India, he wrote that thick book from prison where he talked about this, uh, what is that quotation? Huh? How, to, how to get rid of this? Uh, okay. Hmm? Anyway, his quotation was that in 1939, hmm? it's okay, don't worry about it. Hmm? His view was that in democracy, we give equal weight vote to everybody. Yeah. But to achieve economic and social equity, huh? we, 
we cannot, you know, we have to have equality there too. I mean, equality, equity in votes is not enough. You know, we have to have equity in both social and economic aspects of life. So that was, you know, his view was in as early as 1939, you can imagine, you know. So then in, in 1950, 50, Ambedkar, he was an architect of Indian constitution. He echoed the Nehru's uh, perception of, you know, uh, democracy. And he said, we are going to enter into a life of contradiction in politics. We have equity of one man and one vote, but still we shall continue denying people equality in social and economic life because of our social and economic structure. You know, our social and economic structure is such that we don't achieve equity. We can achieve equal votes for everyone, you know, in election and all that, but we may not achieve. So there's a contradiction. So main message of this paper is that economic growth provides means, but distribution is fundamental to achieve Nehru and Ambedkar's economic and social equality. In this context, you know, the Sen, you know, you, you, Amartya Sen, he was my teacher. He, he got a Nobel Prize in 1998, Amartya Sen. So Sen and Dres point out that economic growth is very important as a means of bettering people's life, but to go much faster, it has to be combined with devoting resources to remove illiteracy, ill health, undernutrition, and other deprivations, okay? So that was, you know, uh, uh, Sen and Dres. Actually, there's a huge debate in India took place between Sen and Bhagwati, you know, that Bhagwati was accusing Sen that he does not pay attention to growth, enough attention. Huh? But he's saying that growth is important, but but you had to go faster than that. You know, you have to do something more than that, you know, just not achieve growth. Huh? So there's a big controversy in India about it. Uh, and Bhagwati and Sen. Uh, but I think I, I, the main focus of the paper is on both growth and distribution. We have a simultaneous, you know, pro these are simultaneous processes and we should pay attention to both simultaneously. They are not mutually exclusive. And then significant shift towards distribution happened in 1990s hmm? and in the new millennium. The consensus among developing economists was that we must have a mixture of growth enhancing and distribution policies to achieve central development goals, okay? So that gave rise to, you know, people started talking about pro-poor growth. And fortunately, I was appointed at the ADB as a consultant, and they were talking, everybody was talking at ADB uh, on pro-poor growth when I joined it. Actually, they had a, in Hawaii, they had a conference, uh, in, in Hawaii, they were, they had a session on pro poor growth. And then they invited me to present my views about uh, pro poor growth. And the thing is that uh, it, development agencies are talking, United Nations, OECD, define pro poor growth as benefiting the poor and providing opportunities to improve their economic situation. Okay. And ADB also had a poverty reduction strategy at that time. It said that poverty redu reduction strategy of ADB described pro poor growth as labor absorbing growth accompanied by policies and programs to mitigate 
inequalities and facilitate income and employment generation for the poor, particularly for women and other traditionally excluded groups. You know, that was the ADB's strategy of pro poor growth. But I found, you know, I was very confused with these, you know, when I looked at that, that these definitions are very broad. They focus on policies to achieve pro poor growth. Maybe they achieve pro poor growth, but broad policy do not help measure pro poor growth. What is pro poor growth? How to measure that, you know? And how the different, these different policies, which they are, you know, ADB was talking about, uh, UN and OECD, how to achieve that. But if you don't know what inclusive proper growth is, how can you achieve, you know, through the policy? You have to, if you have a policy, you have to evaluate them in view of some goal. <coughs> so we worked on that. And actually I wrote a very widely quoted paper, which is published in uh, the ADB's Journal of Asian Economic Review. Pernia and Kakwani, you know, you know Pernia. Yeah. Huh? He he was my you know supervisor at ADB. So we you know wrote that paper, and that paper became a very famous paper, uh, defining what pro poor growth is. So 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 here I just you know give you the definition of pro poor growth. Uh, quickly I will go through, no, without being technical, huh? that there are two concepts, uh, you know, there's the one relative definition is that if the growth rate is positive, the growth process, if it benefits the poor proportionally more than non-poor, then we call it pro-poor. You know, that, you know, from economic growth, people draw benefits, you know, they get benefits, but if, poor gets proportionally more benefits than the non-poor, then we call it pro-poor. Otherwise we call it anti-poor. Similarly, if there the growth rate, total growth rate is negative, and if poor suffer less than the non-poor in reduction of their income, then we also call it pro-poor. But if they suffer more, then it's non-poor. So this is a relative definition of pro-poor when you say proportionally, you know? But then in 2008, we, I wrote paper with He and Song, where we talked about absolute pro poor growth. Hmm? So there's a distinction between relative and absolute. The absolute is that actual, you know, that the, the growth in terms of the amounts of money, you know? Relative is mean proportional to something, you know, the proportional to the mean. So the absolute is that if growth rate is positive, growth process is pro-poor, if the poor enjoy greater absolute benefits from the growth. When I say absolute benefit means the actual income, you know, in terms of, you know, Philippine peso or dollars and, and, and so on. So this is a definition we, this is a stronger definition than the previous one relative to poor growth. And then uh, Ravalian, you know, Martin Ravalian, he's a very famous uh, World Bank economist. He has now passed away, you know, as you might be knowing. He says that growth is pro poor if it reduces poverty. Huh? We don't agree with that definition. I, I can explain that, but, but let me skip that. Hmm. And then, so we wrote a paper called Poverty Equal and Growth Rate uh, in 2008. Huh? Now, link between growth and poverty is very complex, determined by inequality change. So the interrelation between the three factors, poverty, inequality, and growth is known in the literature as PIG, P-I-G, poverty, inequality, and growth. So this was the idea given by, you know, big idea is given in Sumner 2003. So anyway, poverty equivalent growth rate combines the economic growth 
as well as the distribution and come out, comes out with a composite index of growth and distribution. So you can say that, you know, if you want to reduce the poverty and then you should focus not on the growth alone, but poverty equivalent growth rate. That's the, you know, policy prescription. So, but this, uh, you know, a bit complex, you know, because we have to calculate the growth elasticity of poverty. So in this paper, we simplify that and we use the social welfare system um, uh, functions to define pro-poor growth, okay? So, so in this context, I define a uh, power, uh, poverty social welfare function. You know, poverty social welfare function. What is poverty social welfare function? When, you know, the social welfare function means that how much weight you give to the incomes of different people, you know? Huh? In this, you know, here we have, everybody has a different incomes. So how much we give weight to different uh, incomes of the different people, then we can define the social welfare function. So idea of social welfare function is that how much importance you give to different people with different incomes. So that is the idea of uh, uh, social welfare function. It's a weighted average of incomes. Huh? Now, so the poverty social, poverty social welfare function gives all the weights to the poor, okay? Mm -hmm and zero weight to the non-poor, which means that society only cares about the poor. That's why we are talking about pro-poor, you know? And, and whatever happens to the non-poor, we don't care about it. Society doesn't care. So we uh, define social welfare function, which focuses only on, only on the poor because all the weight is given to the poor. So from this, we derive a social welfare function. This doesn't work. Okay, social welfare function, uh, x zero zx, zk, because z is the poverty line. So we have to first identify who are the poor, right? If any household that has income less than the poverty line, household is poor and all the members belonging to that household is also poor, you know? So, so this is a social welfare function, which is gives all the weight to the poor and zero weight to the non-poor. And from there, we, we define, you know, so this is a weighting scheme. It's not working, huh? Hmm? Just a, yeah. Cursor, no, no cursor. Okay. Oh, okay, no. Huh? So here you can see that you know there are you know three kinds of social welfare functions we have used here: V zero, V one, and V two. Huh? Now V zero, that poor, you know, that all the poor get the exactly the same same weight. You know that this horizontal line. I don't know how to. Uh, point out. Hmm? Yeah. So anyway, this is the weighting scheme where we give all the weights to the poor. Now, so from here, we define a pro-poor index, which is the growth rate, growth rate of the social welfare function divided by the growth rate of the mean income. So, oh, it's working now. Huh? Okay, here, you know, this is the social welfare when, you know, when you, you know, the general welfare function. So V0, where all the poor gets the same, same weight, you know, this one, and, it, and non, non poor gets zero weight. And this is V1 and V2, you know, so, 
So the K in this is interpreted as a inequality aversion parameter. The larger the pay K, then you are giving greater importance to the very poor. Okay. Anyway, let's. So this is the you know pro poor index, which we can exclude that. But you know if this this is the pro poor index. If it is greater than one, then we can say that growth is pro poor. If it is less than one, growth is anti poor. So the pattern of growth, pattern of relative growth is determined by this. So this tells you that if there's a gain in the growth rate, hmm, uh, then it is pro poor. If there's a loss of growth rate, then it is non poor. Uh, it's anti poor. So this is a very, you know, that intuitively we are explaining, intuitively the explanation is that gain means pro poor and loss means anti poor you know so which is easy to explain to the policy makers that okay you know that when there's a gain in the growth rate we call it pro poor if there's a loss in growth rate we call it anti poor so so similarly we can have a absolute pro poor growth and uh, Relative to proper growth, let's not worry about it. Hmm. So, so this is the idea of proper growth, to where group, poor get proportionally more benefits than the non-poor. Uh, absolute means that when poor gets absolute amount of uh, output, then it is absolute proper. Okay, so that's the idea of absolute. But now I want to move to development. What is development? Hmm? Now, our view of development that, you know, the poverty or pro poor growth, they are measured in income space. You know, that income, we talk about the income. Income is the means, the growth generates the means. So people have access to the income, so they are they can better their life. You know, they can enhance their life. So if a if a country achieves growth, it is applauded. You know that is a you know it's a developing. You know, country is developing, but growth is measuring in income space, which provides people with the means to lead the better life. Means are necessary but insufficient to give people quality of life they must have. Okay, so according to Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, the economic development has to be, you know, we are talking about pro poor growth, now we are talking about pro poor development. Okay, so according to him, economic development has to be concerned with the kind of people, kind of life people can lead what they can or cannot do. For example, whether they are well nourished, hmm? whether they are they get appropriate education, or ability, ability to escape, avoidable uh, mobility, or, or even the deaths, avoidable deaths, you know. So the development is measured in well-being space in a different space than 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 the poverty are than the pro poor growth. So his idea of development relates to enhancing people's well-being, uh, standard of living. A standard of living is not the same thing as having income. Okay, he developed the most comprehensive framework of well-being through functioning and capabilities. While fu functioning is people's achievement, capability is their ability to achieve, you know? So functionings are directly related to what life people lead, where the capabilities are the freedom people have to choose what life they want to. So choice is also part of the capabilities. So this is the idea of sense idea of well-being, of sense idea of development. 
Okay, so in this paper, we make distinction. The development is different from pro poor growth or poverty or inequality, you know? Uh, the development is uh, quite a different concept. You know, I, I am making the distinction between the two that growth can provide you means, right? And means are useful to achieve better life, but there's no one-to-one -one relationship between them. Yeah. The means are not sufficient, you know? I mean, people have a lot of means, but it's still, they, they may not have good life, you know? Hmm? So there's they, 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 a distinction between the two, right? There's no one-to-one -one relationship between them, you know? Yeah. Uh, let me give you an example that supposing, you know, you enhance, you know, supposing you increase the longevity of the people, supposing you increase the life expectancy of the people, you know, right? So people are living longer, right? But if income is not increasing, so the people are living longer, which means that per capita income is declining. Huh? So which means that that can lead to poverty, huh? but still you can have, you know, a better, uh, longer longevity, you know, longer life, you know. So the relationship between, you know, is not very, you know, one-to-one, uh, uh, -one, you know. I mean, you can have a very rich people, but it's still suffering from obesity, you know. Uh, suffering from many diseases, you know, huh? uh, rich people can suffer. Huh? So they, they, they don't have a good life. You know? So the development is about what life people can lead, huh? where the means are growth provides only the means to achieve better life. But you may not achieve better life always, you know, okay? So that's the distinction between development and uh, and pro poor growth, you know, the pro poor development. Okay, so the pro poor development, uh, oh, what's happening? Gone. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay. Again, we have gone back. Uh -huh. We need to go back. No, no, yeah, go back. A no. lot of. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what we have to do that. Okay, so if we want to, so proper development is about the functioning and the capabilities in terms of the amateur sense, you know, that what kind of life people are leading, you know? So we have to, idea in this paper is to generalize the social welfare function. Because social welfare function is an income space, you know, in terms of income, right? So what we do is we generalize to, uh, we must generalize the poverty social welfare function to the poverty social well-being function, okay? So this is what I've done in the paper, that we are interested in development. So we are talking about generalizing this, so this is a general sort of supposing Wx, omega x is the well-being indicator of a person with income x, huh? okay? From this, it gives you the general uh, well-being function. And from there, we derive pro-poor development index. So, the, so relative pro-poor development is, you know, the growth rate in uh, well-being function divided by the growth rate of the average well-being. 
So from there, we, we immediately shows that relative pro-poor development leads to gain in, gain in relative well-being growth rate and loss gives you uh, anti, you know, it's not pro-poor development, but anti-poor development, okay? Or oh, again. Again, it's going backwards. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so pro-poor development is defined that way. So we have a relative pro-poor development, also absolute pro-poor development. So let's not worry about both distinction between the two. Now, now I want to make a distinction between pro-poor growth and inclusive growth. What's the distinction between the two? Hmm? Now, pro-poor growth is deliberately biased in favor of the poor because as social welfare function, we gave all the weight to the poor. But inclusive development is about the whole population, you know, okay? So in this case, we develop a framework for pro-poor growth, employing poverty social welfare function, assigning weight to the poor only, but non-poor receive zero weight. But in contrast, inclusive growth is broad-based. It covers the whole population. So benefiting everyone, not just the poor, okay? So if growth results in high inequality, some people receive excessive benefits, others receive meager benefits. Huh? So we don't call that as an inclusive growth. Okay, so, I mean, for instance, recently there, there has been a debate in USA, huh, which focuses on 1% against 99%. You must have heard about that debate, huh? where, the top one percent gets the you know lion's share of the you know uh, income, where the bottom ninety percent get very smaller benefits. That has happened in you know, the last 30, 40 years. That's what Angus Deaton was pointing out that you know that that the top one percent are getting too much uh, uh, benefits of the growth. And nine, bottom 90%, 99% are getting very meager, you know. Um, that's too extreme, you know, 1% and 99%. But the basic idea is that the rich are getting uh, much higher benefits than, than the poor. So in that case, we say that growth is not inclusive. Now, Now, so, so what we are doing is that since there is there is a one-to-one -one linkage between equality and social welfare, how we measure e equality depending on the social welfare function we choose, you know. So in case of inclusive growth, social welfare function, everybody gets the positive weight. In pro-poor growth, only the poor gets all the weight, but in case of uh, inclusive growth, only the uh, uh, all, inclusive growth, everybody gets some positive weight. Huh? But so from there, we derive the idea of inequality, you know, the uh, equity. So, so we measure equity in income space using a class of social welfare function. Since inclusive growth is broad-based, yielding benefits to everyone, not just the poor. Hence, social welfare must assign positive weights to everyone in income. And so everyone participate in growth process and benefit from it. Now, supposing there's a discrimination, you know, based on gender, religion, or ethnicity, may exclude some people from the growth process. 
So we don't call that growth as inclusive, you know, because you are if you are if there's a discrimination uh, uh, against some social groups that you are excluding them, we don't call it inclusive growth. Yeah. So inclusive growth depends on how different social groups are benefiting from economic growth. So we can measure, empirically measure the change in inclusiveness by growth between social groups inequality. You know, if there is too much inequality, you know, some, some social groups are benefiting too much and others are benefiting too little, which means that growth is not inclusive. So it's a challenging task to how to relate social groups with inclusive growth. You know, I mean, social groups can be different kinds, like, you know, uh, social groups by gender, uh, social groups by age, you know, because when you have the policies, you target elderly for pension and all that. So, the, so we can have a social group by age, but in India, India there are social groups like, you know, uh, scheduled cost and scheduled tribe, you know, that untouchables, uh, right? How they are treated. So the discrimination goes against the inclusive growth. And so we should measure, you know, because in policies, when we are making policies, we, it's easier to target uh, social groups, you know, that you can target, you know, social groups and have policies so that some particular social groups who are very deprived, they benefit from it. So here, I'm trying to link the two, you know, that how the different social groups are impacting pro-poor growth, are impacting inclusive growth. So the social groups are very important for policy making, you know. I mean, the Philippines also, you may have many social groups, regional, rural, and urban, and, and, and so on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, social groups. So, so we formulate the policies to target the social groups. But in this paper, we are trying to relate the two, that how different social groups impact pro-poor growth, how they impact the inclusive growth. Okay. So, so similarly, we can have a... Uh, uh, in, so in, this is again technical that inclusive growth, I've defined a social welfare function. Now, these are the different weights which we give to achieve inclusive development, inclusive growth. Now, then, so let me escape this uh, technical part. So we can have a, a relative inclusive growth absolute inclusive growth. Uh, so now then we talk about inclusive development, you know, the same thing, you know, the similar idea, the proper growth, we extend it to development, we extend it to what life people can lead. So inclusive growth also, we can generalize the social welfare function, huh? inclusive welfare, social welfare function to inclusive uh, well-being function, including, including in, inclusive well-being function. So that's the way derive, you know, whether growth is inclusive development, there's the inclusive development or non-inclusive development. So these are the different rules which, you know, uh, discuss in details in the paper. Uh, the how to determine whether development is inclusive or whether development is non-inclusive, okay? And similarly, absolute inclusive development, we can have a relative inclusive development, you know? So there are different ideas. Uh -huh. Now I want to give you some illustration of the India, you know? Whether growth has been inclusive or not inclusive, whether growth is pro poor or not pro poor. Hmm? So, these four pro poor growth, pro poor development, inclusive growth, and inclusive development. So, we have applied this for the two decades in India. 
the so as I pointed out, the pro poor growth and inclusive growth is measured in income space, whereas pro poor and inclusive development are measured in well being space. So well being is well being is measured in terms of sense formulation of functioning and capabilities. It is a multi-dimensional concept reflecting many aspects of life. Huh? But we haven't tried to make a one indicator of that, you know. We are dealing separately, you know, that each well-being indicator we are measuring separately, you know, dealing it separately because combining them, there are problems, you know, many, many conceptual problems, which I don't want to indulge it to that, you know. So, so what I have done is uh, to measure inclusive development or pro poor development, I've used uh, infant mortality rate, uh, infant survival rate, life expectancy at birth, adult residate, percentage of children under five years of stunting, percentage of children under um, five years of wasting, and percentage of children do not have sufficient weight for age. So these are the six indicators uh, we have adopted to measure whether development in India has been pro poor or inclusive. So what we have done, you know, because uh, we haven't uh, in India that we could not get the surveys which gives you all the information. So we did the analysis at the state level, you know. You know, different states, whether poor state or rich state, how much development is taking place in poor states and, and rich states. So, so income is measured as a proxy is the net state domestic product. Okay. So, so this is the picture comes out that the real per capita growth rate in India huh, was for about two decades was 6.14%, huh? which is pretty good growth, you know, that India has achieved uh, pretty good growth uh, over two decades, 6.14% 1, 1, annually, you know. And then also we have calculated the absolute growth rate. Absolute growth rate means that it has gained at the yearly rupees 3,463, you know, the absolute means that, you know, that in terms of, you know, for instance, in uh, Philippines, yeah, you can have, you have about 6% growth in Philippines, uh, but you can also measure in absolute terms, how many pesos, you know, every year, real, real income is increasing in, in pesos, you know? So that's the idea of absolute growth, you know, that, you can measure in, in the local in the income, currency of the income. And then we have infant survival rate. In India, points all are positive. Life expectancy growth rate is 0.57 per annum, you know, over 20 years, you know. Uh, and similarly, literacy rate 3.0. Literacy rate in India has grown faster than in case of infant survival rate and share of children stunting 1.54%. And so these are the broad picture, you know, the average picture. But important is whether this picture gives you uh, whether growth is pro poor, inclusive, whether development is pro poor or inclusive, you know, okay? So this can be applied in you know, the Philippines, you know, this same, same thing can be applied to Philippines. And so this is the picture which comes out that we want to know whether India's growth has been pro-poor or anti-poor. Uh, so here you can see that uh, here, left hand side in this figure, you know, there's a loss of growth, you know, that you can see here that depending on the what welfare function is used. Huh? I mean, there are two kinds of welfare functions we have used. One is that poor and very poor, 
you know, they're extremely poor. So here, uh, and then we have an absolute pro poor growth. So you can see that there's a loss of loss always, you know, in this case, relative to poor poor growth, the losing at annual rate of 1.51%, which means that India's growth rate hasn't been pro poor. Similarly, absolute pro poor, India's growth rate hasn't been, you know, it has been declining at the rupees 564. 564. You can think about in the pesos too, you know, that real to real pesos, you know, that say 2011 pesos, you know, so uh, 2000, you know, so real pesos, you can see that how much is the, uh, you know, poor, pro, absolute pro poor growth in terms of the pesos. So, so the conclusion emerging from here is that India's growth rate hasn't been pro poor. Right. Now here, inclusive again, there's, we are having a loss, you know, the relative inclusive growth is reducing at my 0.95%, whereas absolute inclusive growth is reducing at one point, you know, 1652 rupees per annum, you know, real terms, you know. So, so what is the conclusion we are getting is that India's growth rate has been neither pro poor, not inclusive, both relatively and absolutely. I mean, this is a very strong, you know, uh, result which is coming out from India, and India has, you know, has achieved very high economic growth, six percent for twenty years, right? But the benefits of growth haven't been shared, you know, it's, there's a prosperity in India, but not the shared prosperity, okay? So, I mean, this work can be done for Philippines very easily. Uh -huh. And now I look at the development, India relative growth development. So here we can see that the literacy rate, children stunted, children underweight, children wasted, infant survival rate and life expectancy at birth. So you can see here that there's a gain in, you know, you know, the development that, you know, that poor are also gaining, you know, uh, the percentage of you know, life literacy rate has gone up very high, quite high, and percentage of children underweight, but life expectancy has declined, you know, little bit. So which means that what we have identified here is that growth, pro poor development, life expectancy at birth is development in that indicator is not pro poor, you know, the, in life expectancy, but other indicators, they, they have done better. Huh? And uh, poor have done relatively better. Hmm? Now, similarly here, we have, this is the absolute, that was the relative poor of work, but same thing conclusion comes out. But here, uh, same thing com comes out that absolutely the development has been pro poor, except the life expectancy in terms of the relative thing. Now, so, when I presented this the seminar at you know uh, Hyderabad, they were very surprised about it. That how can growth be anti-poor, inclusive? You know, is anti is not inclusive, but development is you know uh, pro-poor. So answer is very simple. Answer is very simple. That. You know, I wrote a paper about many years ago huh, that these indicators of development, you know, like life expectancy at birth, infant survival rate and all that. Hmm, I found out that if you are at a low level of development, right, then it's easier to improve. But if you are at a high level of development, it becomes more difficult. For instance, you know, life expectancy at birth, say 
you want to, if you want to increase from 60 to 65, it's much easier than if you increase 80 to 85. Uh, if you increase 90 to 95, impossible, you know? So, so the idea, that's why, you know, we are getting development to be, you know, pro-poor, uh, inclusive, but not, you know, in, in terms of income, they are not. Uh, that is one, one explanation. But moreover, the development indicators, they have upper limit, you know, they, they cannot go on, you know, increasing where income can, you know, income can increase very, uh, very rapidly and substantially, you know. So income can be pro-poor, uh, may not be pro-poor, may not be inclusive, but development can be. But I, I don't know, this is just the state level analysis, right? But we, we can extend it. Hmm? Uh, we, we should do actually the real thing we should do is use the household survey, exact household survey as they are available in Philippines. And then you can find out whether it has been uh, uh, development has been inclusive or uh, uh, pro poor, right? So this is the you know the illustration from India, but I think they were very surprised when I was trying to explain because they have upper limit, you know. So development is different from you know uh, from income, you know, when you are income space is different from uh, well-being space. Again. Yes. Ah, okay. So, so the concluding, you know, because it was surprising for them huh, that they, I don't know whether they bought my idea or not, but but development, but we haven't, you know, I mean, uh, the re recent literature on, you know, multidimensional poverty, which uh, Celia is working on that, uh, that uh, what they do is they combine different components of well-being, uh, right, to up, uh, to get a composite index of well-being. But here you are not doing that, you know, but if you want to do it, you can do it, but, don't have to, you know, I mean, I see that for instance, we have identified that, that, you know, that four or five indicators, development of pro-poor and anti-poor, or pro-poor and inclusive, but uh, life expectancy is not, you know? So we have identified one, one variable, which is, you know, because, you know, income can have impact, but life expectancy is a long-term, you know, indicator. You know, it's not a short term, you know, where the uh, infant mortality rate and all these, these are more short term indicators. So there is a distinction between the two, you know, so we have to be careful about that. You know, we have to. <laughs> so the main conclusion is that you can measure all these four concepts are different. They are not the same, right? And uh, and we can measure it. We can, once we know what we are measuring, right? Then we can evaluate the policy, whether they are, we are achieving proper growth or inclusive growth or inclusive development by, you know, evaluating different policies. And which you, in Philippines, you can easily do it. You know, somebody has to work on that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking of doing the global picture. You know, here I've done the state level in India, but globally, you know, we can cover 150, 160 countries and each country we can get the information on all these variables, you know, and, and do the whole analysis uh, for, for global, whether globally it has been inclusive, it has been pro-poor, uh, whether development has been inclusive or you know, uh, pro poor and, and so on, mm -hmm. and also the social uh, sex, social uh, you know, uh, social groups. You know, they are very important from a policy point of view. Then, how to you know why particular growth? How much is the contribution of a particular social group to the total pro poor growth? Then you can decide whether to target that particular group for the policy. You know. 
So there's a lot of things can be done here. Huh? Um, we can also uh, relate, you know, that that income find the income income you can have a different kinds of income, hmm? uh, wage income, profit income, you know, uh, uh, and so on. So we can see how much is the contribution of this to inclusive growth, to pro poor growth, uh, and and so on. So a lot of things can be done within this framework. You know, I mean this framework. I think it's very general. You know, it can be applied any country, and we can analyze different policy issues. Okay. So I think I stop here. Hmm? And